Let's do this. So things settled down since uh, Transformers has gone into production? Uh, well, they're just starting to. Um, they're just starting to. The um, You know, we've been producing the limited editions for uh, a couple of weeks now. And uh, so, you know, production startup on anything is always, uh, you know, it's always uh, hectic. And so, uh, yeah, they're starting to get that way. Uh, are all per, are all versions in production now? Like all of them, all four? Yeah, um, all versions are in production, and um, uh, I believe the Europeans and the Australians are just starting to get their limited edition games. Okay. And the um, domestic games will follow. Okay. Well, I've personally spent time on every machine that you've designed except for the home edition of Batman. Um, and uh, tra Transformers, uh, your latest game, was a big hit at Expo, as well as at the Southern Pinball Festival here in Florida, where I got to spend a good amount of time playing it. I personally think it's one of your best games. Um, well, I'm glad you like it. I, um, I actually wish that the... Uh games that have been there have been the uh, limited edition because they have the limiteds have so much more stuff in them and um, you played the you played the pro version right which is um, you know it's the lowest cost model and it's, and it's a model that uh, is um, got a slightly different uh, design um, uh, goal if you will right uh, intended to go into a location earn money, so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it has to have uh, some um, fastball times, and, and yet it has to be compelling, so uh, I'm glad you liked it. I, um, you know, I never, I'm never in love with my games when I finish them, I have to tell you that right now. Okay. <laughs> I always, I always think of, you know, I always, uh, I guess I always, I always think of how much more I could have done, <laughs> and, uh. And I get to like them after, after some time has passed, you know, between, uh, you know, from one to, you know, after I've, I've kind of left it alone for a little while. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't love Transformers yet, but I will. Okay. <laughs> I, felt this, I felt this way about every one of them. I felt this way about Batman. I felt this way about Lord of the Rings. Um, you know, I felt this way about all of them. Okay. Well, well, going into design Transformers, did you know that you'd be designing a, a standard and limited edition versions? Yes. Yes. I knew right away that um, they had to, and it was it was kind of difficult because um, I'm not used to working that way. Um, you know, usually, um, even when I when I worked on Batman, uh, Batman just happened to lend itself to the um, sort of the uh, the removal of certain objects such to, to arrive at the lower cost version right but um, but I think that that transformers was challenging in and of itself because um, I wanted to do a lot for the limited editions and yet whatever I did had to essentially work with the architecture of the, you know, of the pro game. Right. And uh, what are the biggest differences, gameplay-wise, between the two versions? Um, okay, so the, uh, the limited editions have uh, two, two new major toys. Uh, the um, Iron Hide has a, a mini play field which is um, both of the mini, uh, it has two, two features that are uh, primarily different. Um, one is a Starscream uh, toy, which is associated to the left ramp, and it has an Ironhide toy, which is associated to the right ramp. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to create ramps that didn't work the way that, uh, you know, ramps traditionally do, meaning, you know, ramps are usually all about, um, you know, doing something interesting with the ball and then returning the ball back into play. Right. And I wanted to, I, w I just wanted a different, you know, I wanted more interesting ramp ends. And uh, so I 
sort of drove it from that perspective. How do I create some new interesting ramps that uh, are more than ramps, than just ramps? Okay. Uh, so the mini play field on Ironhide, my original concept was that, you know, it's Ironhide playing Cybertronian pinball. And, uh, you know, this is how we play pinball on Cybertron. Ah, okay. You know, it's a very, really a very simple device. Um, has uh, a couple of stretch rubbers and a mini play field that's located at the end of a ramp. And it has a series of sensors that can tell where the ball is when it crosses them. And you bounce the ball, it rotates, it pivots about a center, a center axis. And using a flipper button, the player can tilt the device left and right to try to get the ball moving up there such that the ball crosses the sensors and scores the sensors. Okay. We put, um, we put old school, uh, we thought people would get a kick out of it. And uh, so, you know, you get, you get uh, like the old, the, the, the uh, dings and, uh, and valves that uh, accompany what we think of as, uh, you know, a 1950s pinball machine. Right, right. It's and usually then, what you hear, yeah. Uh, put many things into consideration specifically for home users and or operators when you design a game? Um, yeah, we always think about it a lot. You know, we always think about uh, the differences. Uh, an operator's game is all about earnings and reliability. If, if an operator has good earnings and he's not constantly fixing the game, then uh, you know, I think that uh, that makes for, you know, that, that's what he wants. Uh, he wants quick, he basically wants turnover on the machine. So right. He wants people playing and pointing up again. Uh, you know, so that, that helps, you know, that helps the cash box. Home player, it, it's, the game is all about discovery. It's all about, you know, the game is all about, uh, you know, what, what new cool things am I doing with the game and what am I discovering and how am I... Uh, so the home game has to be designed in such a way that there's uh, a progression of entertainment from the time the player walks up to it until he, you know, until he walks off. So it's, a, it's, a different, it's kind of a different animal. It has, to, it has to challenge you, but it has to challenge you and, um, and provide 
provide a lot of a lot of depth, uh, and the, the challenge is to do it sort of inside the framework of the basic game. Right, and and uh, I I feel that in the pro edition so far, from what I've I've played, is uh, a casual player can get in into it. Uh, enjoy a quick game, and then if someone owns it, uh, like if I own it someday, I would, you know, it's, uh, I can have longer games going on, and uh, I'd play it more than once. I'd play it, you know, m many, many times. So whether if I see it on, you know, being operated or if I own it, uh, I'd be playing it a lot myself. Um, so that's what I get out of it so far. Yeah, I think it's, uh, what you're talking about is, you know, the, the ability to come back and enjoy it in a different way, time and time again, you know, right. um, and I find that, I, I know that when I walk up, when I haven't played a game, I have all my games at home, and, and when, I, when I play my own game, if I haven't played them for a long time, it's fun to kind of rediscover the game, and, and a game that, a game that keeps me coming back is, is a game that I think, okay, we did a good job with that one, you know. Right. So, and all the ones that, all the ones that I really enjoy are games that are not linear in fashion, meaning that you can play them a lot of different ways. You can, you don't necessarily always have to, uh, kind of, uh, you know, work the same goal. Right. So, I think that, I think that makes, you know, that makes pinball really interesting. It's much more, much more interesting than, um, a more linear, uh, event based game like uh, like a modern day console game you know a modern day console game is, is kind of uh, even even though there there are uh, lots of different ways to play it it's a much more limited animal right and uh, how would you describe the, the types of games that you design in general I'm sorry say again how would you describe the types of games that you design well I um, you know, my, my design style and philosophy over the years has evolved. So, when I first set out to design pinball, I was very much a fan of uh, Steve Ritchie games. Right. And not to mention the fact that, you know, he was, his office was across the hall from mine when I first started at Williams. And um, as more as a function of the fact that... Um, uh, you know, he was, he said I liked his game, he sort of mentored me a lot. And so my games in the beginning were very focused on the flow aspect of the game. They, they, um, the ball transition were a big concern, and I liked the speed, and so I kind of started in that direction. As I became more exposed to other designers, and I, and I worked with other designers, like, like when I started, um, uh, you know, I, I was always a friend with Pat Waller before I designed football, and, and you know, he taught me a lot about presentation. Okay. So, um, you know, I sort of acquired some of his, or I tried to acquire, I tried to acquire some of his skill set in terms of, you know, uh, just simple things about choreography and and uh, how to communicate to the player, things that he's very good at. And so, um, so my design style has changed. And the other thing that the other thing that's happened over the years is that you learn from your peers, you learn from your mentors, and you begin to establish your own style. And so my style is very uh, toy centric. I begin with I begin with what is the toy and how is it themed to the game, and then I work the architecture of the game around it. Um, I think a lot about how I can uh, guide the player through the game. I focus on, you know, and, and yet at the same time, you know, my roots in trying to create interesting shots and stuff like that, that, that still remains. Um, when you've done as many pinball machines as I have, the other thing that happens is that you have to become conscious that you're not repeating yourself. So... And some some repetition is inevitable, right. but um, I I try to um, you know 
I try hard to kind of break out of my mold. So this game, this Transformers was a, a, a throwback to my roots. It was a game that I, where I thought a lot about the transition of the shots, like hooking shots together into combination. But I haven't done that for a long time. Um, when I designed Lord of the Rings, I was very focused on not making shots hook up to each other, but I was more focused on anywhere the ball goes, something good should happen. Right. That was sort of my that was sort of my design mantra on that game. When I did Batman, you know, Batman, the architecture was uh, sort of uh, secondary to the toy. So the crane toy um, was so fascinating to me that the, I built the entire game sort of around that crane toy because I knew that that was going to be a cool element. And uh, so I was less concerned about what the ball was doing on, you know, in, in the rest of the shot because I really wanted the player to just kind of get back to playing with the crane. And so when I started Transformers, I was thinking a lot about Johnny Demonic. Right. The second game. And, uh, and Johnny was all about the shots. <laughs> yeah, so that's a long-winded yeah. way. I hope that's a long-winded way of answering your question. <laughs>